especially improving our <coughs> concentration in the devotional activity of chanting the holy names of Krishna. So for the present Kali Yuga, the chanting of the holy names, the Hare Krishna Mahamantra especially, is the Yuga Dharma. And this is what connects us with Krishna. This is what elevates our consciousness. This is what can grant us great ease and purity and pleasure within us if we are able to absorb ourselves in Krishna. The purpose of bhakti and ultimately the purpose of life. We're all looking for peace. We're all looking for purity. We're all looking for pleasure. And all this can be fulfilled by the process of change. So when we are trying to focus on anything, quite often we get distracted. So we are trying to, because this distraction is something which we very easily see in our children. We tell the child, study, and after some time we come back, the child is maybe doing something else, watching this, watching that. We easily get distracted. So this is something which we observe, we anticipate, and we prepare for it. You know, if I just said, my child, you said, please, school your only child. May sit for some time, the child will just go off. So I have to keep a watch. So similarly, within us, there is an inner child. And this inner child is our own mind. The mind is very restless. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita uses the word chanchala to refer to the mind. Chanchala is the adjective also used for the child. So the mind is restless like a child. Now, whatever we wish to do in our life, we need our consciousness to be focused for it. Whether it is a spiritual activity like chanting, even whether it is an activity like having a relationship and having a fruitful interaction with someone, or even whether it is something like entertainment. Somebody is watching a sports match. If they're watching a sports match, and uh, once I was uh, I was coming out of the airport in India, and at the entrance of the airport there's a TV station, there's a TV which people are watching, and then a cricket match was going on over there. So what happened is to go out of the airport, I had to go in between, and the cricket match was probably at a high point. And these people were not ready to let me go. It was it's like, it may take just how much? Two, three seconds. You just walk across the screen. Like, no, we want to watch this match. Just watch. And we just had to move over. And I had to go. No, go later. Watch. Just not ready to go. Not ready to let us go. So, we had to wait for almost 10 minutes before something happened. Maybe the innings ended or whatever. Then we could go through. Just wait, you know, with big eyes, watching completely, taking in everything. So when I saw those people so eagerly watching the cricket match, and they didn't want to miss one moment of the action. I was thinking about how the gopis don't want to stop seeing Krishna for one moment. <laughs> <laughs> they think that, oh, our eyes blink, we cannot see Krishna. And when we can't see Krishna, we have the pride of seeing his beautiful form. So, a similar attraction, although in a mundane directions over here. So the point I'm making is that even to enjoy a cricket match, you need concentration. Now if somebody is watching a cricket match and at the peak moment somebody hits a sixer, then if you're looking somewhere else, hey, I missed the action. Action replay, action replay. 
<laughs> want to see it again. <laughs> so, for any activity that we do in our life, we need concentration. Now, in some cases, concentration comes naturally. In some cases, concentration has to be brought about conscientiously. So, for example, in cricket, if somebody loves a cricket man, loves cricket, then they don't have to make much effort to concentrate. In fact, you have to make effort to get them to think of something else. If somebody watching a cricket match, you talk with them. It's difficult to get them distracted. Now, why does this happen? Because there is interest. There is interest, there is attraction, there is, there is attachment. Basically, there is an emotional connection. I like it. In our consciousness, in our inner world, there is the mind and there is the intelligence. The mind feels emotions and the intelligence analyzes. So, when the mind is attracted to something, that's because it feels good. I like it. So, concentration comes when we have interest in something. When we uh, love something, we just don't have to make any effort. We effortlessly, automatically concentrate. Similarly, there's another situation also when we concentrate. When we know something is important. Say, if we are having a conversation with our boss on phone, and then we are chatting, come and watch it. Stop. Stop. After this. And if our spouse wants to talk, no, stop after this. So we just focus on that thing. If a student, if they are preparing for important, preparing for important exam, it's only one hour a day. And normally, if I'm studying, if some notification comes up on my Facebook, on my somewhere, I mean, I get distracted. One hour before the exam, I'm just too focused. That's because I've understood the importance of that. So interest is one thing that brings concentration and importance. Uh, the awareness of the importance of something that also brings concentration. And if that awareness of the importance has sunk into us, then we get absorbed in it. Because we, this thing, I can't miss this. I have to focus fully so that I can get this right. So then we want to focus on Krishna. See, there are different phases. There is distraction, there is concentration, and there is absorption. So distraction means, say, like right now, we are trying to hear, but then if suddenly somebody speaks in the background, or somebody walks in, then there is distraction. And if you look back, then we are over So distraction means we are not able to concentrate. Concentration means, with effort, we are focusing. Distraction means we are not able to focus. Concentration means with effort, we focus. Absorption means we effortlessly focus. And sometimes in our work, we also sometimes go into a zone where this completely, yeah, this first thing, second thing, third thing, we are able to do things like we are in a flow at that time. So sometimes it happens just uh, by some innate natural arrangement. But the point is that there is from distraction through concentration to absorption. So sometimes absorption just comes naturally. I just feel so interested in something. I want to read this, I want to hear this, I want to understand this. Sometimes we don't feel like it. So if we feel like it, that's great. If we don't feel like it, then we will have to exercise to move from distraction to concentration and identity to absorption. So how do we do that? So as I said, concentration can come from two sources. In the subtle body, in our inner world, there is the mind and there is the intelligence. The mind is drawn by emotions and the intelligence is drawn by analysis, by thoughtfulness, by analysis, by, by contemplation through logical, systematic nourishment. So now Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita several times talks about Mai Artita Mano Buddhi Ma Evishasya Samshaya. Krishna says, You offer your mind and your intelligence to me. 
And if you can offer both of these to me, then Maham Eva Shisya Asamchaya will surely come to me. <coughs> now, when you say mind and intelligence, the mind and intelligence are the primary channels uh, through which the consciousness sprays outwards. So they determine where our consciousness will go. Now, sometimes the mind and intelligence are in conflict. They say, I want to study, that's what my intelligence is saying. But the mind is there, and the dress open final. So I want to see what is the score. Let me do that for one minute. Then I go for one minute. Hey, it's an interesting match. One more minute. One more minute. One more minute. And then I spend an hour over there. So sometimes there's a conflict between the mind and the intelligence. And in this, when the intelligence wins, the mind is not sidelined. The mind works with the intelligence. The mind agrees to the intelligence. And when the mind wins, it is not that the intelligence is sidelined. The intelligence is used by the mind. And, the mind, and then that means, you know, we come up with some reason. You know, I have a lot of time. This five minutes doesn't make any difference. Some kind of reasoning we give to ourselves to actually, we are convincing ourselves. We are using our intelligence to fool ourselves. Our intelligence is meant to make us wise. But when the mind takes control of the intelligence, then the mind uses the intelligence to fool ourselves. It gives us some false reasoning. So basically, when we are trying to concentrate, when we are decided, oh, now I have a chant the whole year, I want to focus. So then, the mind and the intelligence are the two channels through which the consciousness is going to go upwards. So, <clears throat> we need to have at least one of these channels going towards the home. If both are going, that is the best. But at least one needs to go. That means we have to have interest in chanting. Or we have understanding of the importance of chanting. If either of these is there, we will be able to focus. If neither of these is there, neither of these is there, then focus will be impossible. It's a, it, it's not just a matter of a weak willpower. This willpower has to be followed with a process. Just like say <clears throat> I have a slight cough, and if I feel like coughing right now. If I say by my willpower, oh, I will not, I will not cough. How long did I do that? I'm not going to suppress cough for a minute or two. But if the cough is there in the body, I have to use my willpower not to suppress the cough. I have to use the willpower to follow the process of treatment the doctor needs. The doctor may say, avoid oh, oily foods, avoid oh, cold food, avoid oh, cold drinks, and take this medicine. Don't oh, forget, take this medicine. So I need my willpower. If I, if I like, say, cold drinks very much, and I have to use my willpower, no, I won't take the cold drinks. So willpower is required. But willpower has to be coupled with a process. Without the process, raw willpower, I cannot suppress my cup for long. So similarly, when we want to concentrate, when we want to focus ourselves on anything <coughs> in general, and specifically on the holy name in particular, Willpower alone is not enough. I will just concentrate. Yes, it's important to have that intention. That willpower is basically intention. But how do you want to execute that intention? For that, either I have to have the interest or I have to understand the importance. Not just understand, remember the importance. So Shri Goswami is one of our most prominent Acharyas, the Gaudiya Sampradaya. He's called the Siddhanta Acharya. He is explained the Siddhanta, the philosophy of Bhakti, uh, very profoundly with great erudition. So he says that how can we stay in Bhakti? How can we stay in the awareness of Krishna? This is for those who are very advanced devotees, those who have affection for Krishna. Is for them that affection will keep them in Krishna. So he says that for those who are Siddha Bhaktas or for those who are very advanced devotees, their preeti for Krishna, their affection for Krishna will keep them with Krishna. But for those of us who are not very advanced, those who do not have that preeti, 
For us, what will keep us in Krishna is our Bhakti. It is our intelligence. So, this Bhakti and Bhakti is the same thing I only talked about interest and importance. So, if I have interest and my interest in Krishna has developed, my interest in the Holy Name has developed, my interest in the philosophy of Bhakti has developed, then I will feel, I will. I just, I want to understand this. I want to focus on this. So if we have attraction to Krishna, then absorption, Krishna, concentration and absorption will be easy. But when we don't have that interest, we don't have that affection. Now we can't say that we don't have it at all. We all have some bhakti. But the problem is, our bhakti is presently dependent on the mercy of our mind. <laughs> now we are meant to be at the mercy of Krishna. But our bhakti is at the mercy of the mind. And the mercy of the mind means, when the mind feels like it, yes, yes, I want to chant, I want to come to temple, I want to do this. And the mind feels, no, I can't do this. Okay, I can't do it. Okay, okay, I won't do it. It's like that. Sometimes when we chant, we take out our, we take out, sometimes people in chanting, they take out the beads and they look. <laughs> It's so, 108 has somebody put 1,080 over. <laughs> this is not getting over me. It's just going on and on and on. Some, on a few days when we chant, we get such a taste, we have such a power. It's so good. You know? We feel like I should just keep chanting. We feel like chanting should never end. I should just keep chanting, keep absorbing myself in Krishna. And some days we feel chanting never ends. When will it end? It's enough now. I want to get on with other things. This is what our bhakti is largely dependent on the mind right now. It's not our bhakti, but our feeling of attraction towards Krishna. Our affection is largely shaped by the mind. Sometimes the mind feels, yes, Krishna is good. Sometimes the mind says, hey, other things are also good. Yes, yeah, Krishna is good. Too much Krishna is not good. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Yeah. Do a little, go and do other things. So then when this happens, at that time, we, if we have to sustain the practice, then our buddhi is developed. Our intelligence is what will keep us focused. But the mind, where the mind cannot be without affection. Mm -hmm. That means the mind is not attracted to Krishna, the mind is attracted to something else. See, with respect to the body, we can do, I said, I'm not doing activity. I just lie down my bed, I'm not doing anything. But with respect to the mind, we cannot not think of anything. We are always thinking of something. So, this difference between the body's nature and the mind's nature is very important to understand. So, why is that? Because, say, when we are trying to focus on Krishna, and somehow the mind turns off. The mind just switches off. The mind just goes off somewhere else. So, because when I say some people are absent-minded, you know, there's a famous story of the well-known anecdote of the absent-minded professor. Or somebody just takes all their specs, put them on their forehead. Such a you know, the specs, in the specs. Such all over the place. And what has happened? Just somebody else has to tell them, hey, your specs are on your head. You just don't realize it. And what has happened over here? When we say somebody is absent-minded, see the mind is not absent, the mind is always there. But the mind is absent where it is meant to be present. So the mind is, the mind is absent where it is meant to be present. So when I am moving my specs upward, if my mind was there, I would remember, oh, I move my specs over here. Wow, when the mind is absent, then I do that. And I wonder, what did I do? I did put my specs. So absent-minded, sometimes the mind just becomes absent. So, now what happens is that because the mind is inside us and the mind is invisible. So like say, if a teacher is doing class and speaking, the student is sitting in the class and the student is present, so the teacher takes a long call, takes attendance at the start of the class and he calls all the teachers, students are there. And then in between, the student slips off. Where is Simon go? He was here. He was here. Where did he go? Look, you know, there's a big, 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 big,
So what happens in such a situation? At least the teacher is attentive, the teacher is absent-minded, the students will be absent, which will not be realized. But even if the teacher is attentive, what the teacher has to see is, teacher can see because the child is a, is a physical, visible thing. But with respect to our mind, it is not a physical, visible thing. So I will be sitting for chanting, and you know, it's like I, I, I take attendance for myself. Now I'm going to sit and concentrate. I start here. I keep chanting, and the mind slips out. And because the mind is inside us, it's not visibly seen. So, and others also don't see it actually. Even if somebody else is there, those chanting, what happens is they see, they're sitting and chanting, but the mind is checked out. The mind has gone off, the teacher will be teaching nicely, and the child is playing also. So, like that, externally, we are chanting, but the mind is having its own fun. Mind says, You keep chanting, I'll keep enjoying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> when this happens, our chanting just becomes a ritual. Two things happen when this, when this happens. You see, chanting becomes a boredom, and then chanting becomes a burden. Why boredom? Because you know, we, we all want to be constructively engaged. And when the mind checks out, the mind may think, okay, I'm going to think about this, I'm going to think about that, I'm going to enjoy. But the problem is that because we're physically doing a particular activity, the mind can't really act on its fantasies. Mind make a plan, I want to do this, I want to deal with this, I want to speak like this, I want to do like this. But the mind cannot do any of that. So basically, when we are distracted, the body and the mind go out of sync. The body and the mind go out of sync. The body is one place, the mind is some other place. And when that happens, actually neither what the mind is doing is productive, nor what the body is doing is productive. <laughs> by, by out of sync, what I mean is sometimes nowadays people make homemade videos. So maybe they are having some five minutes clear. One person is beating another person. Now normally they sh shoot shooting with the video first, and they have a separate audio device for recording the audio. And they sync the audio and the video. Sometimes if the person doing the thinking is not very careful, then what happens? They come out of sync. So when one person is punching the other person, and the sound of the punch comes, or the fall of the person, the sound of the falling comes before the punch is made out. <laughs> so then you cannot enjoy the movie. What is this? It's out of sync. It first makes sync properly. So like that, our mind and our body, when they go out of sync, we are neither physically productive nor mentally productive. So, it's like I'm trying to do one thing, I'm doing this, doing that, but the mind is checked out. So then, uh, then, then when this happens, at one level we say, yeah, this chanting is so boring. I'm not experiencing anything. Why am I chanting? Why am I chanting? Actually, chanting can be very fulfilling if we connect with Krishna. If we connect with Krishna, if we absorb ourselves in Krishna, then it can be very fulfilling. Because Krishna is the supremely fulfilling companion. So I said, there can be peace that can be pleasure, purity that can be pleasure. All these come by the process of chanting. So peace is what comes when we come to Sattvavana. Mind comes from Prashanta, Manashanta, Yeman, Yogyam, Sukham, Uttaman. And this chanting brings us to the world of goodness, we become peaceful. Then, as we go beyond goodness to spiritual uh, to transcendence, then all the agitation in the mind, all the impurities we go out, we experience purity. Brahma Bhutam Akalmasham Akalmasham. We become free from contamination. And then beyond that, we connect with Krishna. And he will show you the supreme pleasure. Ramante Yogi Manante Satyananda Chidatmani. And the yogis delight hundredly in Krishna. Vashanta Manasam Yegam Yoginam Sukham Uttamam. The yogis experience supreme happiness. So, peace, purity, and pleasure all will come if we connect with Krishna. So, the connection with Krishna can be very fulfilling. But the connection has to happen. When we are, when we are chanting and our mind has checked out, then the connection is not happening. 
And that's why we feel, what am I doing? It's just getting so bored. And not only is it, it appears a bold love, first it's a bold love, but afterwards, it becomes a bold love. Because our mind is thinking, I could do this, I could do that, I could deal with this issue, I could make this thing done. And the mind is thinking, there's so much work to do. And then on top of this chanting, there's so much time. How can I manage it? Then it starts feeling like a bold love. So, actually, chanting is Chanting, working there, bhakti, personal bhakti in general, it is not going to be work. Now if we see it just as one more activity that I have to do in my life, I have 100 things to do and this will become the 101st thing, it will feel like a burden. But if we see that this is an activity that will commit to Krishna, then this activity becomes the anchor for my life. And then this activity of chanting, will keep me anchored while I'm doing everything else. Like, uh, <coughs> I'm just looking from Florida and there's a huge flood over there because this one, oh, in my vision. So now, objects that are very strongly anchored, they will not get flooded away. There are boats, there are cars, the flood companies just sweep them. So like that, in the world, waves come. Waves of Waves of anger, waves of desire, waves of fear, and those waves sweep us away. And if through our chanting we have anchored ourselves to Krishna, then they will not sweep us away. Now, when these waves sweep us away, quite often, <coughs> I may say I have 100 things to do while chanting is the 100 first thing, I, can't, I don't have time for it. But then when one wave of desire or anger or fear sweeps me away, then I forget all the hundred things. I just get carried away with one thing I spend so much time on it. So much of my energy is wasted on it. And then worrying about what may happen, or I'm just craving for this thing, it will get me back to it. So chanting will anchor ourselves in Krishna to the practice of bhakti. That is not just another activity of the world in our life. That is the activity that will enable us to do all the activities more effectively. The anchoring of our consciousness in Krishna is extremely important. So in that sense, if with our intelligence we understand that this chanting is important, then it will not either be a boredom nor be a burden. It becomes a boredom or a burden to the extent we feel we are not connecting with Krishna. If you are connecting with Krishna, that connection requires effort. But it's a fruitful effort, it's a fulfilling effort. And then we will find this is such an empowering and purifying time of my life. Then we will invest ourselves. So when we get distracted, we have to have, we have to have the importance of chanting in our life. So, if you're spending, say, one and a half hours chanting, you need to say, five minutes I spend hearing about chanting, something about chanting, reading something about the importance of chanting, something about the holy name, something about the importance of connecting with Krishna. And those five minutes will remind us of the importance. It, sometimes, whenever we hear classes, you know, or we read spiritual books, yeah, I know all this. See, knowing is good, but knowledge needs to be not just in the brain, somewhere in the background. So some, many times I have seen that I remember points when I have to speak in a class. But when my own mind troubles me, I don't remember that point. Or when I say, I get angry with someone, I don't remember the issue. Chant Krishna's name, I repent Krishna, I should redirect my emotions. All that, that I have to speak class, I can speak as if I am completely free from anger. But when I get angry, all of those points come in my mind. It's very difficult. We have to make sure that this, so the knowledge in the back of the head is like a weapon in the tent for a soldier. 
How many somebody attacks the soldiers? How many are not saying, "Wait, let me go to my tent, get up and go." The enemy is not going to wait like that. So what we need is the soldier needs to have the weapon ready. So like that, when we hear classes, many times we may feel, "I know this one." Ah, the holy name is not different from Krishna. The holy name is so merciful. This, that. I know all these points. Yes, we know all these points, but they are somewhere in the back of the mind. And when we need them, they are not available. In like weapons in the tent, so when it doesn't work. So what we need to do is, whenever we are hearing classes, we can turn it around. Mind that I've heard this. Okay, when did you hear it last? And okay, you heard it, but when did you apply it? When can you apply it? Just turn around the questions, and then what happens? Well, okay, well, this is a good. We hear the class. This is a good point. I can remember. If I could remember this in my chanting, be very helpful. And then you might take a small pocket diary if you want, or just have some points which you can look at just before we start the chanting. So with the intelligence, we remind ourselves of the importance. And the importance is one way we can put push ourselves to concentrate. The buddhi is extremely important. Without the buddhi, we will not be able to focus. So earlier I said willpower alone is not enough. Willpower has to be coupled with the process. So similarly for concentration, just concentrate. No, it will not work. It will work for some time. We have for concentrating. We have to understand why is this important. You know, mother says, "Just study." Child is studying for some time. After the mother is not looking, child stops studying. When the mother explains to the child, why is the child studying important for you? Depend in a way that the child can understand. Then the child take up on the child. I want to study. So like that, you know, we have to remind ourselves of the importance. Not just know the importance, but remind ourselves at the time when we are trying to focus on Krishna. And the second is, I said, what is the second? Importance and interest. Like how do you become absorbed in something? If you have important, if I need important, are they interested in it? So now, with respect to chanting, also, now we are not just creatures of reason; we are also creatures of emotion. So we need to have some emotional connect with Krishna also. So we may decide that how do I connect with Krishna if. In the whole ambit of Krishna Bhakti, if there is something which gives me something that gives me an emotional connect with Krishna, say for example, in the particular darshan of the deities, which I like very much, which makes me feel very emotional. Then we keep a picture of those deities in front of us when we chant. If we feel very emotional when we say "Sri Tulsi Devi," we say, "Can we keep Tulsi in front of us?" Then we say we are initiated or we are planning the initiation. I do not know which deity to bow, but I am going to chant. Then we may keep a picture of our spiritual master, we keep a picture of our initiation. So that is, of course, can remind us the importance, but also the emotional connect. So we have to find out. Some way in which we have emotional connection. So the mind it will get distracted. We can't avoid the distraction, but when it gets distracted, we can bring it back. So either we bring it back by reminding of the importance, or we bring it back by catching its interest. So even if the mind is not interested in the holy name per se. If there is something connected with the holy name, something connected with Krishna that the mind is interested in, so there is the point of concentration, and there is the circle of concentration. So earlier I talked about, uh, we had a previous session before this where I talked about how sometimes distraction can be a means of catching attention. So, like for children. There are two pictures which appear in the identity. But spot the differences. There are ten differences only. Now, if the children say, "Oh, it's the same picture," yeah, I've seen this picture so many times. But in the same picture, it's some subtle difference. Then what happens? Oh, what is the difference? This picture. First time they see the picture, I've seen this picture hundred times. 
Don't be jealous, I'm the big four. Oh, yeah, that's Now, okay, let's do Kinsey's. Let's do Kinsey's. Let's do Kinsey's. Let's do Kinsey's. I was in the last year for Adashtami. I was in the Alachua temple. And they had the Adashtami Darshan. So they had put the, the around 24 of the signs that are there on Adhan's feet. They had put them on different parts of the altar. And then they told that they have students in the school over there. They said, uh, they, they had made a list and they had put a list on the, on the side of the altar. And they said, can you spot this 24? So you know, all the kids, none of the kids would dominate the Darshan for more than one or two minutes. But just standing there for 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> and they did it for kids, but even the adults were standing. <laughs> okay, where is this? Where is this? <laughs> so what happens, actually, is the 24 symbols of Radharani are not. Radharani is important, isn't it? She's already there on the altar. But there was somewhere in her hair, one symbol was there, somebody in her, in her dress, somewhere here was on the shoulder one was there, somewhere in the background, the flower it was there. They put all those in. So what happens? Sometimes distraction is the way to attention. The real thing is to focus on another idea. But when you're not able to focus, create something else by which we bring that focus. So same way for us, when we are trying to chant, focusing on the holy name is difficult. This one sound, actually, it's not all that difficult. If we had affection for Krishna. You know, if we love someone, we call out their name, and their name is not just the name for, for us. When you call out the name of someone we love, immediately the utterance of that name reminds us of the person, reminds us of their activities. So from the Nama comes the Guna, Rupa, and Lila. If somebody loves a loves cricketer, I just mentioned the name of one cricketer, then from that Nama, immediately Guna Rupa Hila comes out. <laughs> oh, this cricket is the aggressive cricket. This cricket right now is a good batsman. You know, that time he is a sixer. So, and, you know, all those thoughts, they automatically come out. Why? Because there is interest, there is attraction. In our case, when we chant Krishna's names, because that attraction is still not there, so the, the utterance of the name of Krishna, the Nama comes from the Nama, from the, Nama the Guna Rupa Lila doesn't come. And because the Guru Rupalila doesn't come, that's why the Nam doesn't seem very interesting. I'm just uttering the same name again and again and again. But as we become pure, as our attraction to Krishna develops, then from the Nama, the Guru Rupalila will also come. And then absorption will come naturally. But till that time, till that happens, we can find some distraction to bring about attention. By distraction, what I mean? I, 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 I just want to focus on the holy name of Krishna. When I can't focus on the holy name, I have something connected with the holy name. As I said earlier, you, know, you could have Krishna Mahatma, you could have some picture of the deities, you could have some picture of our spiritual master, you could have even some words about the holy name. Some people just keep the written print of the holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So all these are, in a sense, they are positive distractions. At the point of concentration, the mind is anyway going to get distracted. But if it is going to get distracted, let it go in a circle of distraction. Instead of going to something entirely sensual, something entirely mundane, let it go to something connected with Krishna. And from there, we can bring it back to Krishna. Bring it back to Krishna. So ultimately, it is Krishna's mercy when Krishna reveals his attractiveness, when Krishna reveals his sweetness. Then absorption will come. But and it's not that Krishna is withholding his sweetness from us. Krishna wants to reveal it, but Krishna wants to see how much we value it. It's like, I conclude with this point. Towards the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that very strongly he says that don't speak this to the enemies. He says that those who if, don't speak this to the enemies, don't speak it to the those who are not devoted, don't speak it to a, a, those who are not having a service attitude. Now we will wonder why is Krishna telling don't speak this? And the next person immediately says, if you speak this, you share this, and you're very happy. You share this with others. And those who share it, very happy. But the point is, see, like I say, a father has built a big empire or a huge estate, a lot of money. 
the, the parents, whatever they have, they want to give to the children. But the parents who have got that full estate, they will not give it to a 10 or 15 year old child. So that child doesn't understand the value. The child is squandered it away. I have a sister in one city, one boy who became a devotee, and he got something like $50,000 from his grandmother in inheritance. And his grandmother, she did not give it to her daughter, she gave it to her grandson. grandson. He gave only in his name. And she did not know. Uh, but what had happened was this, this boy, uh, uh, he was a drug addict. And he was just in an incipient state of drug addiction. But with those $50,000, he spent it all within four months. And at the end of four months, he had to be hospitalized. Had to be treated. I was like, I'm not, you know, he somehow met devotees and now he's become a serious devotee. So it worked out good for him, I think. <laughs> but you know, this whole money squandered. So the parents, they, their money is ultimately for the children. That's what they would like to do. But then they will not give it just like the children. They want the, the child should grow up. The child should learn to value it. Then it's all for the children. When Krishna is saying, don't share this knowledge with others. It doesn't mean that Krishna wants to hide that knowledge. But Krishna wants us to grow up and learn to value it. But similarly, Krishna will reveal sweetness to us. He wants to reveal that sweetness to us. But he wants to see whether we value it. So through our efforts in practicing bhakti, we can just value what we are doing. We show Krishna. Krishna, it's difficult for me to concentrate, but I'll try to concentrate. I value, I value the opportunity to practice bhakti. I value the opportunity to chant your names. I value the opportunity to hear your message. So when we show Krishna that we value bhakti, then we reveal the sweetness of our lives. So it is not just our intelligence or even our interest, our attempt to cultivate interest, our attempt to realize its importance, they're important. But all these, are a part of our effort to show Krishna. And if Krishna sees that we are sincere, then Krishna is curious. And Krishna gives that taste, and the devotee becomes absorbed in Krishna. For us as sadhakas, the gopis of Vrindavan are the topmost examples of how they get absorbed in Krishna. When Krishna left them and went away, the gopis were agonized. How can Krishna use in the way? And what happened was their consciousness was absorbed in Krishna. And although Krishna was far away from them, they constantly think of Krishna. When will Krishna, Krishna come back? When will Krishna come back? And once the gopis were going in the forest, uh, they were going through the forest to Mathura, and uh, to the nearby town to sell their curd, and they saw a yogi sitting in meditation. And they thought, oh, we can also meditate. Why should we marry one of the No, you know, we are thinking about Krishna and Krishna has forgotten us. Krishna has left him gone away. So, they said, we will sit in yogic meditation to forget Krishna. <laughs> if Krishna can forget us, then we can also forget him. We will show him that, we can forget him also. And they sat down in meditation. We <coughs> sit down. We are not going to think about Krishna. <laughs> and then, suddenly, one of them would you know, they were sitting in meditation, they would hear the uh, birds chirping, and the birds chirping would remind them. Go oh, people, do you know? When they were performing Lila with Krishna and Krishna spoke like this. Oh, yeah, Krishna spoke like that. And all the gopis start talking. And they talk for 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. Hey, they're supposed to forget Krishna. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it is meditation. So, for them, their mind is so attracted to Krishna. That even if they want to forget Krishna, they can't forget. So that is the state of spontaneous imperfection. And that is the perfection of life. When the devotee mind is constantly absorbed in Krishna, then there is, although even Krishna is away, because Krishna is present in the heart, in the memory, there is joyfulness. So we will come to that level gradually as we keep practicing Bhakti. Right now, we need to diligently apply ourselves. And although it may appear very long, long process, you know, I keep distracting, my mind is distracted, I bring it back, I get distracted, I bring it back. 
But this isn't a very laborious process. But it is a very fruitful process. Over a period of time, an attraction of Krishna will increase. It will keep increasing. And the process is evolutionary. It's not that every day I chant, I see some new difference. You know, sometimes uh, children, they don't like to eat food. So then mothers may tell them, you eat this food, and you will get thick muscles. And the child eats the food and oops, takes a thick, and the muscles increase. The muscles alone will increase so fast. It's a gradual process. So similarly, for attraction to Krishna, increasing is also gradual. The process is evolutionary. But the result is revolutionary. The result will completely transform our life. Not just revolutionary in terms of taking us to Krishna at the end of our life, but even in this life, if we are attached to Krishna, if we are absorbed in Krishna, then no matter what difficulties come out, we will be able to face them. You know, the waves of storms, the waves of trouble, the waves of distress will come. We are anchored in Krishna. We stay still. So, every day that we are trying to focus on Krishna, trying to connect with Krishna, even if there seems to be no result, every day my mind is in distraction, every day I am struggling and focusing. What is happening? Actually, every day, by the effort, Krishna is observing, Krishna is increased, our attraction to him is increased. And eventually, the result that we need will be revolutionary. So come, Ananda Muti Vardhana Pratipada Purnamrita Swamini. Chaitan Shiksha and Chaitan Shiksha Ashtakam is said that there's an ocean of happiness. And that also is increasing. And each moment we can reach it. That is what is waiting for us. And no matter whatever effort is required to get there, the effort is worth it. But the result is so fulfilling. I'll summarize. I spoke about how to improve our focus in our chanting. And I talked about um, how does concentration happen. It happens either through interest or through intelligence, understanding the importance. I talked about people not wanting to let me slip through where the cricket match is going on. So much interest. Or this person is very important, the exam is very important, conversation with the boss is there. No, later. So, our mind and our intelligence are the two channels by which our consciousness moves. If you can bring them to connect with Krishna, then we can concentrate on Krishna. So, at our stage, the mind's attraction to Krishna is not so strong. For exalted devotees, it is that mind the attraction to Krishna. That priti keeps them in Krishna. For us, it will be our buddhi which will keep us in Krishna. Our intelligence has to be strong. So we have knowledge of the importance of the holy name, of the importance of connecting with Krishna, but that knowledge has to be not just information at the back of our mind. That's like weapons in the tent. Our knowledge has to be accessible when we need it. And we need to keep it accessible. We need to remind ourselves and recollect it at the time when we are going to chant. Take a few minutes before chanting to remind ourselves of the importance and we can focus. And <clears throat> the mind, it checks out. It's like a student who's sitting in class and slips out. So like that, the mind slips out when we're chanting. And when this happens, because the mind is invisible, we do not even realize it. But the result we will realize is, when we're chanting, we'll start feeling bored or we will start feeling burdened. Because when the mind and the body are out of sync, then neither are we doing anything productive at the mental level, nor at the physical level. And that's why we feel bored and burdened. So if as soon as we start feeling bored or burdened, that means it's the connection with whatever. The connection with Krishna will bring peace when it brings our consciousness to goodness, goodness. It will bring purity when it brings our consciousness to the transcendental level. And it will bring pleasure when it brings the consciousness to the devotional level, connects us with Krishna. It's supremely fulfilling. But for that, we have to persevere. And it's not just a matter of being power. I can't just uh, suppress coffee by habit. I need to couple the power with the process. So the, our willpower to concentrate has to couple with the process of nourishing our intelligence to remember the importance of chanting and then cultivating some emotional connection with Krishna. It may be picture of deities, it may be 
Jones, which is Masterpiece in Maharani, or the Little Bit of the Holy Names, something which connects us with Krishna. And through that emotional connection, we can draw our mind towards Krishna. So sometimes, distraction is the way to induce attention. It's like having some others, consumers coming to Radharani on the altar, you start to focus on Darshan. So like that, the mind is going to get distracted. It is going to feel that the mind is holy and familiar. The holy, name, uh, the holy name right now, the Nama doesn't remind us of the Guna Rupa Lila. And that's why it just seems the same old thing. Mm, so it will eventually become purified. But at this stage, if around the point of concentration of the Nama, we have a circle of concentration. And that will help us. When the mind wanders, it is connected with Krishna, we come back to Krishna. And <clears throat> lastly, I talked about how when we are trying to focus on the holy name, the, it's an effortful process, but it's also a fruitful process. And the process is evolutionary, and the result is revolutionary. When Krishna becomes the anchor of our life, then not only will we be ultimately liberated from this material existence, but even if it's this world, and the storms of troubles, of desires, shake us, we'll be anchored upon them. We need to face life's problems much more uh, calmly and effectively when we invest the time to connect with Krishna. So, if um, either the mind, the mind is distracted, then we can remind ourselves that Krishna is the most important person in life. And if I just give this connection to time, Everything else Krishna will work out. With that conviction, we try to absorb ourselves in the Thank you very much. Very